Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Verónica Ibarra y soy directora ejecutiva de SUME Sustentabilidad para México. Somos una asociación sin fines de lucro y además de ser el Green Building Council en México, somos un espacio plural que congrega a todos los sectores de la sociedad interesados y comprometidos con el futuro de nuestro país. Estamos muy contentos de presentar el día de hoy el caso Introducción a la herramienta ARC, Climate Risk, Cabe mencionar que la plataforma ARC será un sólido impulsor de la sustentabilidad para los proyectos inmobiliarios de vanguardia al conectar a las personas, crear nuevos regímenes de eficiencia y comparar el rendimiento de diversos edificios en un mismo Big Data, apoyando la toma de decisiones asertivas y bien informados, informadas durante la vida útil de las edificaciones. Agradecemos a Rebeca Ortiz, líder de desarrollo de negocios de GBC, GBC IMEN México, la oportunidad de poder transmitir en conjunto esta interesante sesión. Estamos seguros que este espacio será de gran interés para ustedes. Cedo la palabra a Rebe, quien nos compartirá la semblanza de nuestra querida ponente del día de hoy. Rebe, te cedo la palabra. Muchas gracias, Vero. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Quiero agradecer a Sustentabilidad para México, su mesa directiva, a su CEO, Vero, Vero Ibarra, a Rocío eh, eh, también, que está ayudándonos desde la coordinación educativa. Eh, soy Rebeca Ortiz, soy la líder de desarrollo de negocios del GBCI en México y hoy estoy muy contenta de retomar este esfuerzo de Lead Innovators donde el día de hoy vamos a platicar sobre la herramienta de, de, de riesgo climático de ARC y antes de entrar en materia les quiero comentar para todos aquellos profesionales Lead que la asistencia a este webinar les puede hacer acreedores a una C Hour el webinar está registrado bajo el número de curso 09-2002-6872. Va a ser favor a Rocío de poner el número de curso en el chat para que todos lo puedan tomar. Y quiero recordarles también que al final tendremos una sesión de preguntas y respuestas, para lo cual los invito a usar el chat. Y bueno, para entrar en materia, les quiero comentar que el riesgo climático se ha convertido en una prioridad para los participantes de la industria inmobiliaria, incluidos inversionistas. Eh, propietarios y administradores de activos inmobiliarios. Este concepto está muy bien descrito en el Financial Stability Board's Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, mejor conocido como TCFD o TCFD. O en español, es el Grupo de Trabajo para Divulgaciones Financieras Relacionadas con el Clima de la Junta de Estabilidad Financiera, TCFD. Eh, TCFD recomienda que las empresas proporcionen información sobre dos dimensiones críticas del riesgo climático. El riesgo de transición, los gerentes deben informar sobre cómo los activos pueden verse afectados eh, eh, por la, la, la transición en una economía de menos carbono, incluidas las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, tanto el alcance 1 como alcance 2 y la intensidad de las emisiones. Y riesgo climático físico. Eh, los administradores deben identificar las amenazas climáticas extremas de riesgo moderado o alto antes de 2030 y una mayor cantidad y variedad de amenazas físicas entre 2030 y 2050. El reconocimiento del valor y la necesidad de esta información se extiende mucho más allá del TCFD y sus partes interesadas. Las herramientas uh, de ARC Climate Risk representan una nueva capacidad significativa para llenar estos vacíos a nivel de activos individuales. Our Climate Risk aborda las dos categorías principales de TCFD y en conjunto estas herramientas brindan información necesaria para comprender y gestionar la transición y el riesgo físico. Cuando se agregan a través de un portafolio y se combinan con información de gobernanza y estrategia, los datos de Our Climate Risk contribuyen a la elaboración de informes completos recomendados por el TCFD y bueno, pues el día de hoy está para platicarnos un poquito más de esto, Cristina Coe. Eh, Cristina es analista de datos de desempeño de ARC. Eh, antes del UFGBC obtuvo una maestría en Ingeniería Civil y Ambiental por la Universidad de Stanford en California. Y comenzó como, como intern, como pasante en ARC, y su trabajo abarca desde estándares de desempeño de construcción hasta ESG y calidad del aire interior. Eh, vamos a, a, sobre todo, creo que es importante decirles que lo que nos va a presentar Cristina eh, es la herramienta que está provista en la, en la plataforma ARC por Moody's, que es la que está eh, disponible para el mercado latinoamericano. Y sin más por el momento, Cristina, thank you so much for accepting our invitation today. Um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Thank you. Okay. 
Can you see the PowerPoint okay? Yes, everything's well. We can see Great. the PowerPoint. Great. Um, hi, uh, my name is Christina Ko. I'm a performance data analyst at ARC. And first of all, I wanna thank Rebecca, Veronica, everyone at SUME and all the participants for joining here today. Um, today, I'll be going over uh, what ARC is, uh, just a brief overview before jumping into climate risk and our climate risk tool, which is an impactful tool that we have for you. I'm gonna get started with what is ARC? So ARC is a wholly owned subsidiary of GBCI and part of the US Green Building Council. We support GBCI's brand and USGBC's transfer, uh, transformation mission. Our purpose is to make measured real world performance an integral part of green building practice, whether that be spaces, buildings, places, or portfolios. Now, what exactly do we do? Let's start with what we're not. We're not a comprehensive environmental management system, nor a utility access platform. Instead, we have a targeted set of features. We score, benchmark, and communicate real world performance for spaces, buildings, and places around the world. So that's what we've been optimized to do. We give people the ability to measure, track, and score operational performance across multiple metrics anywhere in the world. We allow them to compare that performance to lead requirements or uh, building performance standards, and we provide tools to analyze, summarize, and report on your performance. All right, so today the people using ARC are facility managers, corporate sustainability, property companies, and K-12 and higher education. As an example, one of our users is Schneider Electric. They're both a partner and a user. They use ARC to show that their measured operational performance of their building in France is among the highest performing in the world. And they use it as a basis to pursue LEED version 4.1 certification and recertification. We can talk about some numbers now. ARC has over 18,000 active users among 138 countries, we cover over 7 billion square feet, and these spaces are tracking 158 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And around 42% of our projects have pursued or are currently pursuing lead certification. And here is a breakdown of projects and portfolios around the world. By floor area, we have almost half of our projects in the US, but we also have a lot of projects in Italy, Canada, Mexico, China, and India. And we're growing quickly in Japan, Sweden, uh, Colombia, and 121 other countries. As you can see here, Mexico is about 4.7% of our square footage, which puts them at around 300 million square feet of total space in ARC. And if I did my calculation right, that is about um, a little more than 4,000 times the size of Mexico City Metropolitan Cathedral. Okay, now how does ARC work? The takeaway from this is that our portfolio users and, and project users are taking advantage of ARC's characteristics to load everything, score everything, and certify the best. Now this is possible because anyone from anywhere can load their projects for free. Finally, we certify the best as great performing projects might be ready for certification or recognition. A lot of people have questions about the relationship between ARC and LEED. So both ARC and LEED are part of the USGBC family of organizations. LEED requires the use of ARC for operations and maintenance projects. So ARC's performance scores go for LEED version 4.1 certification, recertification, cities and communities. And we translate the LEED requirements into criteria that we apply to project data and then turn it into point allocation for certification and recertification. That being said, we want as many people and places as possible to uh, be in ARC and understand, be able to analyze how well their building is performing, whether it's in the category of energy, water, waste, transportation, or human experience. And that's why anybody can get started in ARC for free. We measure all of those things and we want people to be able to analyze and communicate their performance. Okay, let's get into what we are tracking and go over some basics for spaces and buildings. Like I said before, we track energy and emissions. Energy includes source energy, primary energy, and greenhouse gas intensity, so scope one and scope two emissions. We track water, 
um, and we measure waste in terms of generation and diversion. We also look at operational transportation to and from the building, including uh, greenhouse gas emissions and distance. And lastly, we track um, human experience, which consists of occupant satisfaction surveys and measured indoor air quality. These are the core metrics available to ARC users, and we can use these metrics for things like climate risk, modeling, and building performance standards. Now we do all of this to provide a basis for communication of performance, the interpretation of how your space is performing, whether it is relevant to benchmarks, standards, or historical baseline. We have this in the form of widgets and animations, like this racetrack on the top right, which is also what we saw at the front of the Lead Innovators event um, PowerPoint slide. We can email this information, we can generate reports to support communication with other stakeholders. So in general, we want to encourage communication, whether that be in a climate risk disclosure report, celebration of great performance, or even just an email to uh, like automatic updates to team members. Okay, now let's move on to the topic of today's discussion, which is climate risk. I'm going to read the overall problem uh, statement here. Commercial real estate cannot run away from a changing climate. It can and should prepare to thrive under shocks and stressors. And so what is this a combination of? First, combining science-based evidence. We need, and we need and we mostly have propelling evidence that the impacts of climate change require us to act urgently. Next is investor demand, which includes climate risk disclosure so that we can communicate these priorities that stem from climate change. We need new regulation, and this is already happening as climate risk disclosures are increasingly becoming required. We have to consider occupant expectations as people expect their facilities and buildings that they work and live in to be resilient to climate change. And lastly, weather-related losses. So kind of tying with the first factor of science-based evidence, we're seeing significant losses from these events. Now, these are the factors that drive us to change. And these are the factors that drive us to manage our transition risk and physical risk. I'll start with some figures here on how climate change looks like around the world. We can see that there is higher and higher frequency of areas experiencing extreme temperatures, which is defined as days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is global warming at a glance. More specifically towards Mexico, we see the average annual mean temperatures from 1901 to 2021. It started around 20 degrees Celsius and over 120 years, we've increased our average mean temperature to almost 22, 22 degrees Celsius. And as global temperatures are rising and some already dry areas are becoming even drier, forest fires are happening more frequently. So I'm over in California, and last year, it, we could see the sky looking orange all around us. So we had, it looked like we had glasses on that had orange tints because it was just everywhere. And so it kind of looked like we were stuck in this huge blanket of just poor air quality. Climate change means more frequent climate disasters, but it also means more extreme events of these disasters. So the polar, the polar vortex in Texas and Northern Mexico was the most extreme cold event in a decade. It was hard to protect or prepare the people, the, the plants and agriculture, and also the properties. There was also extreme rain last year in parts of Europe, which resulted in flooding where hundreds of people died, cars and houses were swept away, and huge landslides were triggered. These are just a few of the examples of the impact that climate change has had in terms of extreme weather events. And with all these events, it looks like we're moving towards a new, um, unfortunately, a new normal where we have more hot weather and more extreme hot weather. Our new climate is shifting to the right as we continue to create anthropogenic emissions or do other activities that are detrimental to the environment. There's also extra vulnerability to large cities where areas are more developed and susceptible to large amounts of damage from extreme weather. This map, um, I hope you can see it okay, uh, shows the hazard risk within the circles that represent urban areas. 
So if we look at the area around Mexico City, they have more than 19 million people at a high hazard risk area. We can see that the coastal regions on the side usually have higher hazard risk. These are based on, um, these hazard risks are based on the risk of cyclones, flooding, uh, landslides, and drought. So a lot of people in denser areas are susceptible to these hazards. Here we can see the population change of countries, uh, counties with higher and lower climate risk. The higher the bar, the more people are moving into them. This means that people, at least in the US, are actually moving into the places that have higher climate risk. They're moving towards places with more heat, more droughts, fires, floods, and storms. And actually, to add on top of that, much of our infrastructure is also not well equipped to withstand these events or properly protect their occupants from these events. And so this is becoming um, a larger, more like an avalanche kind of disastrous issue. And so people are moving towards areas that have higher climate risk also means that we're spending even more on these catastrophes. Like here, flooding has such a high financial impact at $105 billion lost as part of catastrophe related weather events. But at the same time, people are moving towards areas more susceptible to flooding. And so the impact within facilities is that there's flooding in garages, there are schools without air conditioning that have to end their school day earlier or end their school year earlier, and wildfires are destroying homes and people have to evacuate and move. Part of these impacts is due to the fact that infrastructure was built for the climate of the past. So given all this change and extreme events, most of our current infrastructure can't, can't actually withstand our changing climate. An example from this article is Hurricane Harvey and its destruction of homes. City planners already knew that their infrastructure wasn't designed for weaker hurricanes, let alone Hurricane Harvey. And here's a chart of states and what year of rainfall data they use for infrastructure planning. So you can see on the right, only a handful of states are using the proper and more current data to design their infrastructure. Whereas other states like Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming are using outdated data that doesn't reflect how storms are becoming more intense. And if we look at precipitation changes over the years, a lot of the U.S. is getting more rain, while the other half is getting less and becoming more dry. And with all this precipitation change, whether it's more or less, people need more current and perhaps even uh, predicted future precipitation data for proper infrastructure planning. And I know this is only a map of the U.S., but I know we can definitely see changes in precipitation around the world, too. Not even just for precipitation, but in general, we need to plan for vulnerability of housing and buildings as a whole. The UN's Guide on Climate Resilient Buildings and Communities states that this vulnerability depends on a lot of factors from design to location. That means making consideration for building structure, for floods, landslides, snow, and storms when deciding on location. Also considering building construction uh, and materials, and then lastly, looking at design for indoor climate. We can see some of these factors and the hazards that it can result in and the vulnerabilities within our facility operations. The climate effect has a lot of interdisciplinary relationships with weather and then hazard and then vulnerabilities. If we look at intensified weather, <clears throat> Uh, we can see that it has a primary relationship with four different things related to floods and extreme storms. Then those hazards are related to, um, or those, those effects are related to hazards like transportation disruption or water shortages. And then those things are tied to uh, vulnerabilities like to water or to sewage. And then even within vulnerabilities, we can see changes in like heating, cooling, fire, safety and such also impact other things like telecom, lighting, and ventilation. There are some adopted strategies for climate change resilience, 
where buildings can increase their adaptation and mitigation with demand reduction, uh, energy efficiency, and energy substitution. The different sizes of these bubbles represent the priority levels according to RDH and DC housing. We can see that the energy efficiency uh, and demand reduction can tackle many of the high priority issues like air tightness, uh, shading, air source heat pumps, and window to wall ratios. So now we've got, we know the issues related to climate risk. We've got extreme weather events. We have outdated infrastructure. We can evaluate the vulnerabilities we're susceptible to. And so now the investor response to these issues and solutions for adapt adaptation, mitigation, and climate risk in general is climate fo focused leadership. And so, for example, TCFD looks at climate risk, including transition and physical risk. Now, transition risk is climate policy action and technology improvements to move the economy off of fossil fuel usage. This is uh, basically changes made in response to climate change issues. And then physical risk is the risk resulting from climate events, so more frequent and severe natural events like droughts and floods. Considering the transition and physical risk together, we can get a complete sense of our overall um, climate risk and your risk exposure, which consists of economic losses, stranded assets, and inaccurate valuation. And so with climate change and its impacts, we need to start taking action. We have to look at hazard exposure and assess the risks of such exposure, determine the resilience strategies we can take, and execute these plans with iteration. Investors and stakeholders need to do something similar. They need to understand their portfolio and market risk, consider the financial under market conditions, plan for resilience due to different outcomes, other portfolio, and then follow through with their plan. And that's where our uh, ARC's climate to, uh, risk tool comes in. We have transition risk based on your carbon score, which I will go into in a second. We'll consider your electrification, and then we consider your physical risk and partner with Moody's ESG solutions. And I'll go over the aspects of physical risk we cover and then show you our carbon score uh, for transition risk. For those who are looking to align with TCFD or GRESS and their frameworks, this tool covers some of those bases. bases. So um, GRESS asks what fraction of assets have done risk assessments within the last three years. This is how you boost your assessment. They'll also ask for um, what you assess your risk for. And I'll show you what we cover. We cover heat stroke, water stress, sea level rise, hurricanes and typhoons. And for each of these, we have subcategories for specific measures um, in each of them. We also cover floods, earthquakes, and wildfires. Again, each with scoring and measures for each subcategory. Now, I'll show you exactly what it looks like on our platform. And see if I can share. See, um, this one. Okay. So let's move on to the platform itself. I'll go to our website, which is already here, arcsco.com, uh, where you can log in and find a lot of our solutions and resources. While you are uh, entering, I think that it's so. Um, I want to remind the audience that anybody can use ARC and track their uh, their buildings' impacts. So this mm -hmm. is something you know, like um, there's some some part of it that it's paid, but in general, anybody can start track uh, uploading their information and tracking their information. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the really the the platform is free for all. That's right, thank you. Okay, so the account being used here is your USGBC account. Uh, if you don't have one, it takes 30 seconds to create. I'll log in with our demo account. Okay, so um, you can see like the basic structure of projects, portfolios, and insights. Um, a project can be a space, building, campus, or even a city. 
so I'll go into our demonstration project. Okay, so the basic elements in the project include your dashboard, uh, your data, a set of modeling tools, and additional project tools like climate risk over here. Now I wanna walk you through the data portion uh, because this is really important for getting set up. And so the first thing you do is you set up your building settings. We care about the size of your project, operational hours, and um, occupants. And you can input those here. And then once you've established building settings, you can start adding your meter data. Now there's no, there's no uh, limit to how many meters you wanna add. So one electricity and one gas meter is great. You can also have 100 meters um, and you can name it however you want. Like you see over here, we have Rebecca's meter. Now for making the most out of our climate risk tool, you can input your energy usage here. Now we have other categories in water waste, transportation uh, and human experience, but for climate risk, um, I think energy data input is good enough. So over to performance. Okay. We translate the energy and carbon performance into a, sorry, my internet is slow, into a zero to a hundred score. Let me change it to performance score. You can track it month by month, and we present uh, key performance indicators like electricity consumption, natural gas, site energy, source energy, and various intensity metrics for baseline performance periods. So that's some of the performance aspects we have in our platform. Move over to climate risk now. We partner with Moody's ESG solutions to combine our carbon score with electrification and physical risk for this package of information for reporting. Uh, for example, like for grants. Your carbon score depends on your emissions from energy use. Uh, transition risk, again, is all about moving away from fossil fuels. So you can evaluate your carbon score to determine uh, your transition risk. We also want to let you know your electrification score. So this is the ratio of electricity use to overall energy use. So if you, for example, if you use one kilowatt of a kilowatt hour of electricity and 99 kilowatt hours of natural gas in a given time period, your electricity score would be one out of 100, which doesn't sound very great. Now, let's say we want to see um, how our carbon score and therefore transition risk change with uh, changes in your building energy usage or emissions. So for our essential users, there are modeling tools. On the left here, there are a few independent variables. These are the inputs to the score. And then we have the inputs that are variable like source energy and carbon emissions. And then we translate these into energy score. As you can see, your the carbon emission score is here related to transition risk. And if you want also lead points. So uh, let's say we wanna try to increase our carbon score. So we buy 100% carbon offsets and so we go from our current to zero. No surprise there, your carbon score is now 100 out of 100. I'm gonna reset it. Um, let's say you only have one occupant for this entire energy use. Your score is gonna go down by a lot. And so it's, uh, it's really helpful to use these models to see what would happen if you uh, changed your energy usage, your occupancy, or your operating hours. Um, carbon emissions. Now, the next thing we can do to manage transition risk is our advanced scoring tool. Oh, I have that over here. This is a feature that allows users to track and score their performance against building performance standards, whether it's required, um, voluntary, or for recognition. So let's take a look at a program called Carbon Risk Real Estate Monitor, or CREM. You can pick um, your country, space type, and then specific plan path. So let's say we want to check OM, and then for say an office. 
So um, CRIM calculates how buildings should be performing each year until 2050 to reach their climate goal. And so you can see how well you do with their year over year emissions target to reach uh, say a 1.5 degree plan by 2050 or a less stringent one, the two degree plan by 2050. This is a demo project, so it passes until 2050 um, because we put in very little energy usage. Okay, that's enough about transition risk. Let's move on to physical risk, which is what our partner, uh, Moody's ESG Solutions provides. We partner with them to provide a package of transition and physical risk so that users can obtain a better understanding of their climate risk, whether it's for disclosure or transparency or anything else. So you'll be able to view your report here. And this is an example of what the report would look like. It has the categories I mentioned in the PowerPoint with their subcategories. You can take a look at heat stress. So it tells you the hazard, your risk level, the, the score, and the country benchmark. So for each of these, there is a country minimum, country average, and a country maximum. Your score for each of these, and then the risk level. And then you can also go into one of the subcategories sub like energy demand. They tell you that they're measuring it based off of cooling degree days. That's their measure, that's your score, and that's the country benchmark. So you want a lower score uh, because that, that means you have lower risk. We can take a look at the flood one two. Yeah, so it looks similar, um, just with different, different types of physical risk. Uh, they measure it differently. So, for example, this one is number of days in a year where rainfall is has exceeded 10 millimeters compared to the baseline. And again, with your score. And really quickly, I'm going to show you one more thing. Oh, this uh, climate risk tool also comes with a certificate that um, that you've done climate risk reporting. We also give you an Excel sheet, which is basically um, the report, but only with the measurements and the scores. So it's easier to look at it all together. We have the category, subcategory, measure, score, and then your risk. Oh, and then um, it tells you the levels of your score to tell you the, the type, the level of risk that you are at. All right, so that's my presentation on climate risk and ARC. If you have any questions, let me know, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Otherwise, I can get back to you. Christina, that one question. So yeah. um, I just want, want, want the audience to know, uh, this um, uh, application can be used either for buildings or for uh, cities and communities as well? Uh, yes, I think for, yes, it should. Um, but okay. if you say have like, uh, buildings in multiple places, then you would have to have one for each one. Perfect. So, um, so let me just tell you guys that this is um, uh, something extra. And if you want to access this application, you will have to uh, uh, pay extra per building. I can give you the information if you if you send me an email. But uh, of course, that you can also find it in ARC. We have a, a, our cost uh, information. Or very transparently in the in the in the in the web page. So, mm -hmm. whatever works for you. And now let me start reading you the questions. So, is it possible to connect Arc with an external data source via API, JSON, uh, with webhook, or similar? Uh, yes, we do have a lot of integration partners um, that flow data back and forth. Uh, the main one is Energy Star, but I know that that's very US centric. So um, we do have integration partners for that. Uh, there are also like 20 or 14 other integration partners that we do to sync that data. Um, I'll have to check for that list to see if um, it's covered. Then this is another question, Christina, thank you. Uh, this report can also be done as a portfolio, uh, comparing all buildings on, on one single report. Uh, all buildings on one single report. Um, no, I think because especially if say your your buildings are in very different areas, uh, we would have to 
have one report for each building. Obviously you can collate it. Um, and there would be, if you have a lot of different buildings, there would be bulk pricing available. I'm going to put in the slides, um, the link to the slides, if you wanna take a look at the figures. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, I think you did. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's that. I will appreciate that because everybody's going to be asking for for your presentation. Um, I would like to know if anybody else. I I, I have Sofia Mejia uh, with her uh, with her hand up. Sofia, do you have any questions? Um. No, not anymore. I think it was just, uh, oh, here, let's see. No, no, no questions from Sophia. So um, this is a very brief presentation, guys. Um, as you see, uh, the, the climate uh, art risk is, is uh, available in, in, in uh, again in ARC. And uh, if you have any, want any extra information about it, if you want to start using it, um, please contact me and, and uh, and I will I will set up a, a meeting with you guys and and the art team. Uh, we're very thankful for for having Christina today. Um, I was uh, I was worried that that we couldn't have somebody you know that could get give us a demo and show us how this works. As you can see, you know um, it's part of also uh, of uh, the reporting uh, uh, information that you can have for your clients. So I think uh, this is something that that will definitely help you. Um, well, Christina, I just want to thank you so much again for being with us today. Um, we will be bothering you a little bit from Mexico. Thank no, you thank so you much so for much. your time. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Muchas gracias. Les recordamos a todos. Uh, bueno, gracias Rebe, gracias Cristina por esta extraordinaria presentación, antes que nada. Y bueno, les recordamos que SUME comparte webinars, cursos, talleres y otros eventos todas las semanas. Los invitamos a seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales para que puedan enterarse de nuestra oferta académica y de nuestras actividades para que se sumen a SUME. Muchas gracias a todos y que tengan una maravillosa tarde.